I know that Doug probably doesn't care, but if I won the $640 million, I would probably spend it reenacting that scene from Pretty Woman where she goes into Rodeo Drive. <laughs> Just my own little thought. Um, but on to more serious topics, which is micro-influence entrepreneurship and the future of protest. So, 2011 was like a really big year for technology, proving what an effective tool it could be uh, in mass mobilizing people around a shared cause. We saw it everywhere from the uprisings in the Middle East to Occupy Wall Street, even the protests in Moscow and in Greece. And what I thought was really interesting was that when I saw that Time magazine had indicated that their protester was the person of the year, it occurred to me that it wasn't so much the mass mobilization that I found so fascinating and with so much potential, but it was actually the fact that if you look behind the mass mobilization, technology has actually enabled us on the lowest common denominator, which is the level of the individual, to have an incredible impact on the world around us. And I thought to myself, well, what would that mean to have so much power? And when I started looking into it, I realized that we have come into a new generation where every single person sitting in this room has the ability, using existing tools, to have a big impact and to disrupt the status quo. And I call these people architects. And architects are people who can apply technology in a creative way and provide alternatives make the world into a different place than what already existed. And I wanted to know, what does being an architect or living in an architect world mean, about, uh, mean for our world in terms of protest? So I was looking at this in a very, very simple way. But generally, most protests have two big elements. They have a critical mass of people that need to participate in order for it to be effective. And you need some type of economic cost. When you put the two of those things together, you hit a certain magic number with the people involved create such a big economic cost for the person you're protesting against that they become forced to change. And that results in a very effective, peaceful protest. And if you actually look at different examples from history, we've always seen this to sort of be the case. I mean, Gandhi, the father of nonviolent protest, he had a critical mass, but he also told his supporters to boycott British goods, to buy Indian textiles, to uh, stop paying tax on British salt. So he really had the whole equation. Martin Luther King was the same thing. Critical mass, but a big element of his protesting techniques was boycotts and strikes by you know, sanitation workers and unions and labor leaders. And this, for a really long time, was the general equation for a peaceful protest. But the problem is, is that a lot of institutions like government and businesses and even education just can't keep up with the pace of innovation of what's happening right now. There's so much technological advancement and a lot of them are so burdened by legacy systems that what we see is this big emerging gap between the systems that we have and the systems that we need. And what that means is, is that not only is the gap getting bigger, but even if they wanted to change, they're having a harder and harder time um, sort of changing to our demands because they just simply can't keep up. And this means that the rate of change, or if we are going to get big changes from, this, from these big institutions, we're going to have to change the equation. And that's what I wanted to look at today, was how could architects influence that type of equation? So, this is Molly. Molly is a 22-year-old student who worked two part-time jobs. And when she got a notice in the mail one day from Bank of America letting her know that they were going to introduce a $5 uh, banking fee each month for using her debit card. Now, she got really upset about this. And what she decided to do was that she logged online to a site called uh, change.org. And she created a petition letting Bank of America know how much she, she did not appreciate that extra fee on her bill every month. What ended up happening was that she used her network and she used her connections. And the, the petition started getting more and more traction. And eventually, 300,000 people signed that petition, pledging to close their bank accounts with Bank of America if this uh, charge went through. And what ended up happening after that was that Bank of America uh, did not introduce that charge, but uh, several other American banks also took that charge away. Now, what's interesting about Molly is that she had the critical mass, she had the boycott, but she added another element, which was micro-influence. She was just a regular person. She wasn't like Gandhi or Martin Luther King, people that had spent years working around these issues very publicly. She was just a regular person who saw something that she didn't like, 
and ended up changing it. So I asked myself, is this now the new equation for a protest? And the reality is no, because it's actually missing a very key piece. So in 2008, when I was volunteering on the Obama campaign, there's something really interesting happened in September of 2008. And what happened was, it was the Republican National Convention, and Governor Sarah Palin had just given this wildly popular speech about how she really didn't believe in the power of community organizers to impact their communities and their neighborhoods. Now this sentiment was really in direct opposition to the Obama community that was built around the notion that any individual could go out into their neighborhoods and into their cities and towns and be a force of good. So what ended up happening was the Obama campaign sent out an email saying, look, if you uh, don't agree with this, donate $5 or $10. The result was that in 24 hours we raised $10 million. And in the rest of the month of September, we raised $150 million. And that event really struck out in my mind because I realized that the equation looked more like this. You have the critical mass of people, but instead of boycotting and just telling people to withdraw their money, you actually replace that with an alternative, something positive, a means of support for people to getting engaged that once they did it using their micro-influence of all the people that made small donations, they ended up um, having a big impact. $750 million was raised by the Obama campaign for people investing in a different future. And I want to bring that example to Occupy Wall Street for a second because I think that what's happening here is really interesting. I've been both like a supporter and a critic of the campaign. I appreciate their commitment to the cause and their commitment in coming out every day, but a piece of me sometimes questions the effectiveness of some of their tactics in terms of getting the type of change that they want. And the reality of it is, is that this is because it's become a very difficult, at least in my opinion, to distinguish some of the ties between government and, and corporations and private interest groups. So lobbying figures, for example, $1.44 billion in 1998, almost doubled $3.3 billion. The financial industry is actually the number one or the highest contributor to political campaigns. Uh, with $200 million being invested, split between Republicans and Democrats. This is a graph that shows the revolving door policy of people that served in the federal government, overlapping with serving, for example, in Goldman Sachs. So all of these really just point to the fact that this relationship between government and corporations and lobbyists is very intertwined. It's not my position here to say whether it's good or bad. This is just this, the way that it is, and this is the situation that we need to work with. And when you take the complexity of that situation, you start to see that it's very hard to apply that equation of critical mass and boycotting or even micro-influence because you're dealing with a bit of a hybrid. And when you actually break down what Occupy Wall Street is doing, I think that there's potential, but they have some gaps, and here's why. They lack the critical mass but they have the boycott and they have the micro-influence. And the reason they lack the critical mass is because they haven't offered anybody an alternative to, of, of, of support. And the reason I started thinking about this, about this lack of alternative, about this lack of support, was that when you really think about it, um, there's, if they gave people an alternative of ways to engage with the financial institutions, I think they would have a very broad base of people that would be on board. Because we can all agree that the financial system has its own flaws and has its set of challenges and obstacles, but for many people it's the only option. And I, really, I realized this in uh, November, because on November they have this thing called Bank Transfer Day where they encouraged everyone to close their bank accounts and move to a credit union. Now, what happened was in the five weeks leading to that, so on September 29th, Bank of America w proposed this $5 fee, and up until November 5th, there was over uh, $4.5 billion of assets that were moved out of banks and into credit unions. Over 650,000 people, and between, a million, between 650,000 and a million people ended up moving, their, closing their bank accounts. Now, 650,000, that's a lot of people. That's way more people than was probably protesting in Times Square and Zuccotti Park. So to me, I realized that if there were more solutions that were like this, then potentially you can have people sitting at home, the people sort of on the fence, who also participated and helped pave the way for changes. So what that means, the bigger picture of that, is that I believe that in every protest there's an economic opportunity. Every protest is pretty much a consumer segment that's telling you that there is some unmet need that they are not getting. 
And so if you extend that, well then, if protesting is usually something bad, we're always withholding something, abstaining from something, taking something away. If we turn that equation on, on its head, what if we made protest something good? What if instead of taking something out of the system, we put it back in? What if instead of waiting for banks and institutions and and all of these different parties to change, we're standing on the sidelines yelling at them to change, what if we led the way um, it, by changing ourselves first? And this is where entrepreneurs come in, this is where architects come in, because we're already seeing such a dramatic um, innovation in the financial industry. We've got uh, services like Mint teaching people financial budgeting, Venmo taking uh, issue with payments and mobile payment plans, we've got Kickstarter, we've got Second Market. I mean, Kickstarter took a look and was founded on the principle that it was it was way too hard, way too difficult to go into a bank and get a loan. So instead of creating a big protest and going into banks and saying, change your policies, make it easier for us to get money, they just created an alternative platform and a new business model that permitted people to completely bypass the issue and create a type of so social change while adding a positive element to the, to the conversation. And that's what I think the future of protest is. I think we're going to need to see people creating new ideas, and not just, and you don't, not every single person have to, has to create a new idea. We all have this micro influence. We can all support and put our weight and our consumer dollars and our social capital behind ideas that create business models that create a reflection of a better type of world, a world that we want to see. And why I really think this is the way forward is that I think it takes into account the idea of accountability. We're in this mess, not because just one party was 100% wrong, but because there were mistakes that were made and poor decisions that were made on both sides. So ultimately, we can't just sit pointing fingers at institutions, ordering them to fix themselves, when we also have just as much accountability and just as much incentive to create systems of our own. So I guess to finish, I really want to emphasize the fact that the future is going to come from architects, from individuals who use the power of technology to create business models and new markets and new opportunities that will leave us or build a world where we can all feel empowered. Thank you.